Gracias. I, I want to begin with a comment from a friend of mine uh, last night when we were talking. She said, it's good to have an open mind, but be careful that our brains don't fall out. So that, <laughs> that's something we should bear in mind, that we don't be too open for the wrong kinds of ideas as well. Uh, I would like to talk about the geopolitical aspects. You heard a marvelous presentation on the biological, scientific, unscientific aspects of GMO and round up the glyphosates that are paired with them. Uh, I would like to concentrate a little bit on where this beast came from that's plaguing our planet and our populations. And I, back in 2005, I had done research uh, since the 1980s on the GATT Uruguay round. I'd uh, been to Brussels many times to interview the Farmers Association, the uh, Deputy Commissioner of Agriculture, who at that point was a Danish uh, gentleman who said, I don't understand why European Union money should go to subsidize a bunch of small farmers in Bavaria. Well, those small farmers in Bavaria are some of the most ardent anti-GMO crusaders in, in uh, the world. So uh, there is a good reason. But uh, when I was asked to do a book about GMO by a friend of mine who was uh, setting up a publishing house in Zagreb in Croatia back in 2005, I started researching, and I, I suppose I write books partly in an autobiographical sense and partly to learn new things, to keep my mind alive, keep it from stagnating. But as I dug into the research of GMO and the patenting of seeds, I came across something that perked my ears up, even before I got this strange microphone. Oh. I keep having trouble falling, falling off here. And that was that the earliest research on GMOs... I can't see what is... Okay, the earliest can be... Oh. Well, maybe I'll just try it like this. The earliest research... The earliest research on GMOs... I'll do it this way. Was financed by the Rockefeller Foundation. Now that interested me tremendously because I had spent years researching the Rockefeller machine, the political machine of the most powerful family in America after World War II. And so I came across the name Rockefeller and I really got interested in the subject. And what I found out uh, astonished even me. I went back to the 1930s and I found that the Rockefellers had actually created an entire field of the study of biology, starting with grants to Caltech in California, California Institute of Technology, and Cambridge University in England, two very high quality science universities. Since then it's spread almost entirely over the world. They created something, a fraudulent branch, this may shock some of you, a fraudulent branch of biology called molecular biology, based on a principle of scientific reductionism. And they maintained that they could reduce the complexity of life to a single gene, and as you saw in the previous presentation, take a cannon or another means and shoot foreign matter into that gene and change the expression of, of that gene. The problem with this is it's not stable, among other things, but that didn't deter the family Rockefeller. So they, into the 40s and after the war, the Rockefeller Foundation with its tax-free money was one of the few sources for scientific research in these elite universities, and the universities grabbed it up and began promoting molecular biology. Then, 
right after the war, Nelson Rockefeller took a scientist who worked for the Rockefeller University, named, named Norman Borlaug, down to Mexico to see about the possibilities of introducing a variety of wheat that Borlaug had developed at the university called Wonder Wheat. And the Green Revolution was born. It was a Rockefeller revolution. A lot of hype and a lot of lies. The Green Revolution was aimed at creating something that the Rockefellers also sponsored at Harvard Business School in the 1950s, creating agribusiness. So instead of small peasant plots in places like Mexico, you would have large latifundas, latifundista uh, concentrations, and you would grow these uh, strains of wheat that Rockefeller scientists introduced into Mexico. And in the early 1950s, the Rockefeller Foundation financed a project at the Harvard Business School with Ray Goldberg and the former Assistant Secretary of Agriculture, John Davis, under Eisenhower. They literally created the business model for what today dominates the human food chain and the animal food chain around the world, and that is agribusiness. You go today to a supermarket in Moscow, you go today downtown Beijing, or any place in China, and you see precisely the same products. They're brought in there by Unilever, by Nestle, by Kellogg's, uh, General Foods, and all of those products contain GM. All of the corn, almost 100% of the corn grown in the United States, which is the biggest corn exporting nation, is genetically manipulated. Virtually all of the soybeans commercially grown in the world, which means Argentina, Brazil, and United States, is genetically manipulated. Patented seeds, largely from Monsanto. Well, the agribusiness model was to transform American agriculture. They started with orange juice in Florida, the citrus groves of Florida, and began creating a vertical, top-down model, a corporate model. The idea of a family farmer who actually cares about the health of his animals, monitors them, gets up at 4 o'clock in the morning when one of his calves uh, takes ill or something and, and tries to find out what the problem is. That began to be transformed during the 1980s and the 90s in America, the 70s too, into industrialized farming. You have mass feed feedlots, uh, concentrated feeding organizations, CAFOs, where tens of thousands of, of uh, animals are crowded together. They started with chickens, Tyson Farms in Arkansas, good friend of uh, Bill Clinton's. And by now it's spread to virtually all of the meat that's consumed in the United States. It's pumped up with antibiotics to make it grow fatter faster, and then it's fed a diet of GMO almost exclusively. So it's probably a good time to think about becoming a vegetarian if you live in the United States. In Europe it's not quite so bad, but because we import most of the power feed that farmers use to feed their livestock, and virtually all of that is transported by Archer Daniel Midland or Cargill or the American Grain Cartel companies, and all of that is GMO, then we're getting GMO through the back door, and it's not labeled in the European Union. Well, where did this idea of GMO really come from? It came, as I found out in my researches, from a fascination that very, very powerful and very bad people like the Rockefellers had since they become, became the world's wealthiest people, a fascination with something called eugenics. How many of you are familiar with what eugenics is all about? Well, for those of you who aren't, eugenics is so-called race breeding science. You have a superior race, like the Rockefellers or the Rothschilds, as they see it, not as I see it, but as they see it, and then you have the unwanted, the 
human cancer, as one of their people called it, the human cancer that spreads, reproduces. So after the end of World War II, the Rockefellers became one of the largest financial patrons of something called the American Eugenics Society. And a very, very close family friend of the Rockefeller family, Margaret Sanger, created the Planned Parenthood Federation, which was nothing but a disguised form of eugenics. And during the 30s, she went into Harlem, which is a, a black ghetto in New York City, and created something called the Negro Project. Uh, she wrote in a letter to a friend that somehow leaked into the public domain, fortunately. She said, if the black ministers ever get wind of the fact that the Negro Project is about reducing the black population, or the Negro population as it was called then, uh, then our project is in real trouble. That was eugenics. Well, they held a conference, the American Eugenics Society, and announced, the president of the society announced, that as of today, the new name of eugenics is genetics. And that began this mad project to try to alter the gene, to manipulate the gene of life by reducing the complexity of biological life down to the single gene and changing its expression. The same Rockefeller Foundation from the 1920s on into the eve of the First World War financed all of the eugenics research from the time Hitler came into power until 1939, six full years, in the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Berlin and in Munich, research on how to eliminate useless eaters, undesirable gypsies, uh, Jews, and so forth. Mengele, the Nazi doctors, they were all receiving uh, money from the Rockefellers. And only because, as one of the members of the board of the Rockefeller Foundation put it after coming back from a fact-finding trip to see how the money was being spent in Germany, said it's a pity that the Nazis have such a bad press internationally because they're doing what we only talk about doing here in America, selective sterilization and such things like that. They're really doing it. It's a pity. Well, this, this is the political or geopolitical background to the GMO project. And in the 50s, John D. Rockefeller III, who specialized in Asia and in population reduction, the four brothers divided the world up among them after the war. Well, John D. Rockefeller III created something called the Population Council. The purpose of the Population Council was to reduce population. They hired demographers at elite universities like Princeton to come up with scary numbers that would terrify the population about how Indian people are reproducing like rabbits and there's famine because there are too many people in India and so forth. Uh, Africa, they did the same thing, China. Uh, so that most of the world came to believe, especially in the industrial world, came to believe that uh, the greatest danger on earth today is overpopulation. Well, don't worry, because the Rockefellers, through their population council, began funding all sorts of research in birth control devices, intrauterine devices, and so forth. They were a little bit sad that their money didn't uh, finance the creation of the birth control pill in the 60s, but they did everything to promulgate it and support it once it was discovered. And John D. Rockefeller III turned to a protege of the Rockefeller family in the early 1970s, who was then the national security advisor to the president, President Nixon, by the name of Henry Kissinger. Perhaps some of you have heard of this gentleman. And Kissinger was commissioned to do a top secret study called NSSM 200. It later in the 1990s, this was in 1974, 
In the 1990s, it was finally declassified from top secrecy, and people could read what was in there. But it became, on the signature of President Gerald Ford, it became official U.S. government policy for the first time to impose population reduction on what Kissinger called developing countries where they have rapid population growth and rich raw material resources that the West needs to fight the Cold War. Oil, metals, rare earth metals, whatever. So Kissinger argued that these rapid population increases will create population that will demand of their governments that they get a share of the pie, that they have an economic development. Well, what an obscene thing for populations to demand economic development, a good standard of living, uh, adequate food, shelter, and so forth. We can't allow that to happen, so we have to reduce populations. So they made as a condition of any U.S. government aid that third world countries or developing countries had to have a population plan in place. No ticky, no laundry, no population reduction plans, no U.S. government assistance, no food aid when you have a famine and so forth without a population plan in place. Well, gradually, the United Nations, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund adopted on, on U.S. pressure, Washington pressure, they adopted these population reduction policies so they did not have to do it directly through the U.S. government. They had plausible deniability. This is some of the background to the Rockefeller GMO project. Then they went to an institute that Rockefeller Money had created called the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines and financed the development of what they called golden rice. They call it golden rice because it came out a very strange yellowish color. But the argument was, we will develop rice that is genetically modified to contain vitamin A so that uh, newborns in Asia, poverty areas of Asia, would not have blindness that is caused by vitamin A deficiency. Well, after years and years of research and Rockefeller money, they developed their golden rice. The only problem, as one scientist uh, demonstrated in, in an experiment in India, is that a newborn baby would have to eat eight kilograms or so of golden rice every day to get the amount of vitamin A that you get from carrots and other natural vegetables. So that project uh, did not quite go the way the Rockefellers had dreamed. Then in the United States, they began something with President George Herbert Walker Bush in 1992. Monsanto went to the White House. Monsanto is a special corporation, as is DuPont and Dow, the other two giants of the GMO uh, revolution. Monsanto, which had been in the orbit of the Rockefeller family since World War I, making chemicals and Agent Orange and dioxin and, and such beautiful things. Monsanto had shifted with Rockefeller encouragement. There was a Rockefeller on the board of directors of Monsanto. He just died recently at 102 years of age. William Rockefeller, I believe, was his name. Uh, it's strange how these Rockefellers seem to have uh, obscene longevity. David Rockefeller is now 98 or 97, still claims to be the, the godfather of the family. Well, they convinced President Bush in 1992 that America had developed something through Monsanto's laboratories that could make American agriculture the world king and that was patented seeds paired to Monsanto chemicals, as you heard in the previous presentations, the Roundup and Roundup Ready soybeans and corn. And they convinced President Bush, it didn't take convincing, President Bush gladly agreed to issue instructions to the Food and Drug Administration, 
the National Institutes of Health, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, that GMO corn or GMO soybeans, if you hold up a stalk of GMO corn, it pretty much looks like a stalk of non-GMO corn, or an ear rather, that it pretty much tastes like non-GMO corn, it smells like non-GMO corn. So why do we need to do any independent scientific government studies if this stuff is healthy for humans or animals? It's substantially equivalent. Now, think about that term for a minute. Substantially means what? What? Almost. It's one of those beautiful legal phrases that means absolutely anything you want it to mean. Equivalent means exactly, one to one. Well, by putting the adjective substantially, or the adverb substantially equivalent, you completely change the rules of the game. It's not equivalent. It's an unnatural uh, transformation of normal seeds. Well, that declaration by President Bush, which has been reinforced by every single president, Bill Clinton, uh, baby Bush, and now Barack Obama, that there is no independent government testing of the health and safety of GMO. Not only that, the GMO lobby, Monsanto, Dow, Cargill, Archidania Midland, they drafted the rules that became the agreement on agriculture for something called the World Trade Organization in the early 1990s. So in those rules, if a country tries to stop free trade in GMO soybeans from Monsanto coming into the country, they're in violation of WTO rules. And the health and safety of a nation is deemed less important the way these rules were written by very clever Monsanto lawyers like Michael Taylor, who's now in the Obama administration overseeing the destruction of food safety in the United States. Well, the rules of the WTO were carefully written so that it looks like it's protecting health and safety, but it does quite the opposite. And when the European Union, several years ago during the Iraq War, actually 2003, the European Union tried to, uh, well, the commissioners were quite ready to take money under the table from Monsanto and, and the European Food Safety Authority uh, accepted Monsanto money for their independent university research, but the population in Europe resisted GMO and still does ferociously, even more than ever. So. President Bush, baby Bush, decided to sue at the World Trade Organization to sue the European Union for not uh, accepting more GMO in the EU. They partly won the suit, but still there has been virtually no uh, widespread acceptance of GMO in Europe. As was mentioned earlier, Austria forbids GMO. I believe Greece did, I don't know if they still do, after the IMF has literally destroyed anything resembling Greek sovereignty. But a number of countries in Europe do not allow GMO. Switzerland had a referendum on it, and farmers there managed to work with some courageous scientists in the universities to get the word out, and the Swiss people rejected GMO for a moratorium period of five years, and that period is soon to come up for another uh, test, we'll see what happens. Hopefully, they'll continue it. But the situation today is such that, as I say, virtually all of the packaged meat that we eat in the supermarket, unless you can verify that it comes from a local farmer who has taken pains to feed uh, non GMO uh, feed to his pigs or his cattle or his chickens, uh, 
that that's going to be GMO. And as the Seralini study documented, you heard earlier, the scientists in France documented that the, the chemical that's, that's paired to the seeds, to the modified seeds, and you cannot buy Roundup ready seeds without signing a contract that you buy Roundup. And Roundup, it not only contains glyphosate, it contains proprietary chemicals which are not revealed to the public as to what they are. And Seralini's team tested the effects of this and found that the Roundup, the chemicals, the herbicide, it's sprayed on uh, usually by aerial spraying in places like Argentina, that these chemicals are toxic to cells in a human embryo in quantities less, as I recall, less than that recommended for garden usage. And Roundup is the most common weed killer in the world today, in China, in Europe, in the United States. So it's a form, actually, of chemical warfare, if you want to uh, I wrote an article recently for the internet and I said if Obama really is serious about doing something against chemical warfare, he should turn those drones on the Monsanto headquarters in St. Louis and bomb Monsanto. <laughs> well, in 1999, Monsanto got into trouble with the, the project. The project goes back to something that I mentioned in my first talk from Ken Henry Kissinger, a Rockefeller protege. He said back in the 70s, if you control oil, you control entire nations. If you control food, you control the people. Control what we eat, the toxins that build up in our system that 20, 30 years later emerge as cancer or, or uh, heart problems or other things that uh, make us ineffective as uh, live, thinking, active people that can make trouble for government policies that are destructive to us. So in 1999, they announced that they were taking over, not, they're not only buying up all the independent seed companies around the world, so they're the biggest owner of seeds, but they announced that they were buying up a, a small con company in Mississippi called Delta and Pineland. Well, Delta and Pineland was interesting to Monsanto for one particular reason. They, in cooperation with the United States government, had developed a seed called Genetic Use Restriction Technology, GERT, called in the popular press or the uh, ecological press called Terminator Technology, as in the Arnold Schwarzenegger Hollywood movies where he comes out with this massive automatic weapon and just terminates everybody in sight. Well, this comes close to the Rockefeller dream because Terminator allows Monsanto to sell seeds to a farmer in India or in China or in Africa somewhere. And that seed will terminate, commit suicide after one harvest. So you're in a form of serfdom, of bondage that is never before been possible in the history of human agriculture. Farmers cannot replant a portion of their seeds for the next harvest. They completely lose their independence to a foreign multinational, or one of four usually. And on that basis alone, even if GMOs would increase harvest yields, even if it could be proven that GMOs were completely safe to human and animal health, which they aren't. Even if GMOs required less herbicides, which they don't, they require more over the long term. I would oppose GMO with all my energy because it's controlled by three to four multinationals, chemical companies, and three of those are some of the most criminal corporations on the face of the earth. They developed Agent Orange for use in defoliating the jungles of Vietnam during the Vietnam War. 
lied about the effects of that on their own employees to avoid paying uh, liabilities. They have lied about it up to the present to avoid, uh, and the government, U.S. government has lied about it and not acknowledge the damage that American soldiers underwent from the toxic effects of working with, with uh, Agent Orange during the war. And they did the same with dioxin, with PCBs, dumping it into the water rivers uh, nearby their factories in the US. And these three corporations, which intimately work with the Pentagon and have for decades on chemical warfare, we are supposed to trust we're supposed to trust Monsanto that they do the scientific studies that are given to the government, that the government doesn't need to waste taxpayer money doing independent scientific studies like Seralini did, this upstart up uh, there in Ken University in France, uh, because Monsanto is so generous with their research dollars that they fund uh, the research before the government uh, has to do anything. Well. A hue and cry went up about the purchase of Delta and Pineland because they had patent terminator with the US government. And the president of the Rockefeller Foundation went, flew to St. Louis to the headquarters of Monsanto and had an emergency meeting with the board of directors of the corporation and convinced them to tell the world that they were not proceeding with the merger of Delta and Pineland, that they were not going to commercialize Terminator technology. They s chose their words very carefully. Well, the US government, the Department of Agriculture, gave an interview to a, a farm journal, a farm industry journal, agribusiness journal, where they said, we have no intention of stopping our research on Terminator technology. This is gonna give American uh, agriculture exports a huge uh, chunk of the world market. And uh, we're keeping up with that. So the US government uh, is complicit in this criminal enterprise called GMO. And indeed, the Rockefeller or the Monsanto Corporation did drop its takeover bid for Delta and Pineland until 2007 when Greenpeace and all the other NGOs that were campaigning against Terminator got tired of uh, the subject of GMO, the people weren't so interested as they were in other things, so they looked around for another issue to rally the masses. And at that point, Monsanto announced that it was taking over the same company, Delta and Pineland, seven years later, or eight years later, but they said, Delta and Pine has developed a strain of cotton that we're interested in acquiring. Oh, cotton, well, that's okay. I guess, you know, we don't have to worry about eating cotton. So Monsanto today owns Terminator technology with the US government. They've been very, very discreet and quiet about it, so we don't have any uh, knowledge of when they're gonna roll that out or if they have rolled it out in places like India where there have been large GMO cotton harvest failures. The GMO project is, as I said earlier, genetics is the new name of eugenics. Well, the United States government was involved with a small San Diego, California biotech company called Epicyte, E-P-I-C-Y-T-E. You can look it up in the internet, but you won't find much because uh, most reference to Epicet has been scrubbed. I spent weeks trying to track this down. I read an article, an extremely poorly written article, uh, claiming that uh, GMO was responsible for genocide, but the person who wrote it didn't give any footnotes, didn't get, give any leads, so I as a researcher had to just keep searching and searching. But I got lucky, I stumbled across a local San Diego newspaper where they had a, a section on biotech startups in, in, in the county. And lo and behold, I found the press release of Epicet in September 2001. I think the world was kind of preoccupied by other things in September 2001, if I recall correctly. Something about some big buildings in New York and Washington, something happened, I, I forget exactly some 19 Arabs with box cutters and strange things like that. So people 
didn't really pay much attention when the president of Epicet held a press conference and pointed behind him and said, behind me is a hothouse full of spermicidal corn. Now, what did he mean? He said, this is the solution to the world overpopulation. He had developed and patented corn that when it's eaten by a human male makes the sperm infertile, so you cannot conceive. Now, isn't that beautiful? Imagine you're sitting there in the middle of Oaxaca, Mexico, about to eat your tortilla. Say, would you like a little spermicide with your tortilla, Jose? Now, this is no joke. These are people out to reduce the human population, as, as Charles Shaw uh, described it the other night. Reduce the human population to several hundred million, perhaps a billion, two billion to start with, and then dramatically down from there, because they regard people as cancer. Well, Epicet disappeared as an independent company. It was bought up by a uh, North Carolina biotech company, but not before it signed licensing agreements with Dow Chemical, Dow AgroSciences, another one of the GMO giants, to license this epicyte uh, spermicidal corn worldwide. Well, for obvious political reasons, uh, they're keeping a very low profile on spermicidal corn, but uh, it would be interesting to test to what extent the corn cradle of the world corn uh, seed varieties in Oaxaca, Mexico has been contaminated by spermicidal GMO corn varieties. Well, some people say nobody in their right mind would do such a thing, would they? The problem is there are people who are not in their right minds, and many of the most powerful bad people on our planet are not in their right minds. Uh, and they are doing this. Then it was discovered, this is not a direct GMO, but to give you an idea of what the Rockefeller Foundation does with its wonderful money. Together, I believe, with the government of Norway and uh, other uh, foundation money, they spent years in cooperation with the World Unhealthy Organization in Geneva, WHO, developing a vaccine for tetanus. You all know what tetanus is. You know, when you step on a rusty nail in nature and it goes through the punctures, it's a puncture wound, and you can get lockjaw, and the symptoms are, are quite unpleasant. So they began giving free vaccination to women in Nicaragua in the early 90s, I believe. Women in Nicaragua between age 14 and 45. Well, now, men can also step on rusty nails in the jungles of Nicaragua or wherever in the cities. So a Catholic lay organization called Profita Catolica, fortunately, there are some uh, organizations that have their antenna up for birth reduction. The Catholic Church uh, lay organization Profita is one of them. They got suspicious that why was this only being given to women of a childbearing age? 14 to 45 approximately, and they took a sample of the vaccine to an independent laboratory and held a press conference announcing that that vaccine was laced with an abortifact that would cause a uh, woman who had, had uh, been impregnated, in, uh, it was pregnant, to abort so that would have a charming effect on, on population growth in, in Nicaragua. And the WHO vehemently denied that this was the case. So the Profito organization presented the biological test laboratory results to the world. And they said, oh, well, this must have been a bad sample in the laboratory. This was a, a, a batch that got contaminated somehow. So. This is what the GMO revolution is all about. They are having difficulties, fortunately. Number one, it's unstable. 
Arpad Pustai, a dear friend of mine who unfortunately is not able to travel around and speak since the last five years he had a terrible stroke. Uh, he told me when we were speaking in the conference together in Magdeburg, Magdeburg uh, Germany uh, six years ago, he said the problem with GMO is that the gene is always switched on, that it's unstable and there is no method of genetic manipulation known to science and he, he doesn't believe there's any possible that uh, can manipulate seeds in a way that does all the wonderful things that are being promised, cure vitamin uh, deficiency, vitamin A deficiency, or increase harvest yields, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, they're not intended to do any of those things. They're intended to control the breadbasket of the world. They're intended to put nations like China under the thumb of these three or four corporations who could switch off the seed supply at a second's notice if China didn't do what Washington wanted. Uh, we see what Washington has done with the banking system and cutting off the uh, oil sales of a country like Iran because they decide to through the SWIFT interbank system. So now Monsanto has teamed up with Bill Gates, the Gates Foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates, uh, being great humanitarians, introducing vaccines all over Africa. They have a project to vaccinate every child in Africa with various forms of poison. Instead of uh, spending $10 billion on, on clean water supplies, which would have a dramatic effect on uh, sickness and death and so forth in Africa, they're spending $10 billion on injecting every child in Africa with poisons called vaccines. Well, the Gates Foundation has become a major shareholder in Monsanto. And they also, together with the Rockefeller Foundation, the two of the biggest private foundations in the world, sponsor something called the Green Revolution in Africa. Kofi Annan, the uh, Ghanaian who was Secretary General of the United Nations for years, was recruited by Bill Gates and David Rockefeller and company to become the secretary of the Green Revolution in Africa. And the purpose of the Green Revolution in Africa, where you have some of the world's finest unspoiled uh, soils for growing, the entire planet could be fed from the, uh, the soils that we have in Africa, some, some uh, agronomists have estimated, the entire planet, so we're not in a danger of starvation by any means. The project is to introduce GMO all across Africa by stealth. And many African countries, you know, they're, they're not uh, as stupid as some white people think. They can actually read and write and uh, read scientific reports on the internet and uh, reject things that they think are unhealthy for them. But that is the purpose of the Gates Foundation uh, grants in, in Africa for the Green Revolution. Well, Bill Gates and David Rockefeller, together with Warren Buffett, issued an invitation, a private invitation, about five years ago to a group of about 10 of the wealthiest people in America to come to a meeting at the Rockefeller University President's House in New York to create something they called the Good Club. This was in the middle of the greatest financial crisis in human history, and one would think that these very, very wealthy and powerful people might be talking about what can we do to uh, avoid such financial crises. No, they didn't care about that. They weren't interested. They talked about how to solve the human population explosion as the most pressing problem. Well, if people haven't looked at the statistics recently, some have estimated within 20 to 30 years the greatest population problem we will face on this planet is a collapse of population growth rates, a dramatic collapse of population growth rates, the demographic opposite of what uh, people in the Obama administration and virtually every U.S. government uh, since Jimmy Carter's day 
uh, have claimed is, is the greatest problem facing mankind, this overpopulation. China is facing a demographic catastrophe. Within about 20 years, there will be 100 million Chinese males with no statistical possibility of a female partner. And imagine the kind of unrest that that's liable to cause. It's already becoming a serious problem in China because on the advice of the Population Council of John D. Rockefeller III, the Chinese government 30 years ago adopted the one-child policy. Unfortunately, I'm told by Chinese uh, who are active in campaigning on the truth about GMO in China, professors, that Monsanto has come into rural areas of China and bribed local government officials to introduce GMO seeds in China. So China is far from GMO free, unfortunately. Uh, one encouraging sign, however, is that when the Chinese government, the prime minister announced in 2010, I believe it was, that they had granted a license to a Chinese company to commercialize GMO rice in China, but it was okay because it was a Chinese company. My book, the, this one here, The Seeds of Destruction, The Hidden Agenda of Genetic Manipulation, had just been translated into Chinese a year before, and my publisher had brought me over to Beijing and different cities in China to meet with uh, Chinese media and to get the book out in universities and so. So Chinese journalists began arguing against their own government, something you would never see with the American free press these days, I wager, that the Chinese government-owned media started arguing against their own government, quoting this little book that I just held up uh, and, and sections from my book as arguments against GMO. Uh, the, another story that is encouraging as well, because people uh, have often asked, what can I do as a single person? In 2008, we had a dramatic spike in world grain prices, rice and grains. At the same time, there was a dramatic spike in the oil price, over $140 a barrel. Well, this was manipulated by the Wall Street banks as they were trying to recoup the losses of the real estate debacle. And it was manipulated by the Bush administration by offering taxpayer subsidies to farmers to take land out of agriculture cultivation and grow corn to burn as fuel, something I don't think is a very good sound practice when people are starving around the world. But uh, be that as it may, 40% by this year, 2008, of the corn harvest in the United States was being used for biofuels. And that created a shortage on the world grain markets. Then there were famines and, and or not famines, harvest failures because of drought in, I believe, in Russia and certain of the grain belts of Ukraine. But the price of grains went soaring through the roof and a commission, a pontifical academy of science, there are five pontifical academies in the Vatican, I learned, because one, one of the five invited me to speak on, on GMO, uh, a lay organization. Uh, but the pontifical academy of science, which has as its advisors, scientists from around the world, very well-known scientists, respected scientists. The problem is they're not always honest scientists. Well, the Pontifical Academy of Science decided to give GMO the green light. And the Vatican, as an official policy, had resisted GMO up until that point. But they got an ailing pope to or they thought they had an alien pope, uh, to be convinced of the benefit of GMO to solve world hunger. And one can imagine, uh, even though popes are supposed to be infallible, that he doesn't have time to do original research on the scientific 
uh, validity of GMO or such issues, so he relies on expert advice. Well, the head of this pontifical academy gave a press conference and he said, GMOs are perfectly fine for humans. This is rubbish that they have a bad effect on our health. I know because I was a pontifical uh, uh, representative of the Vatican at the United Nations in New York for eight years, and I ate GMO all the time, and look at me, I'm fine. Talk about an idiot. Well, political manipulation, Mon Monsanto and the US State Department, because the US government pushes this poison as active policy, as WikiLeaks uh, demonstrated with the ambassador to uh, France pushing Monsanto products, something that ought to be a conflict of interest, I would think. Um, the Pope was invited to the Food and Agriculture Organization in Rome, and it was believed by the organizers, the US government and others, that the Pope had been convinced by this Pontifical Academy to give the holy blessing to GMO to solve world hunger, based on a lie that it would solve world hunger, which it won't, quite the opposite. And something happened, a deus ex machina maybe, I don't know, but the secretary of a second pontifical academy had been given a copy of this little book here, Seeds of Destruction, by a priest in Baltimore, Maryland, who knew him personally. And the priest in Baltimore, Father Bing, an extremely courageous man who invited me to Rome to speak to his lay organization of priests from all over the world about GMO. Father Bing told uh, Father Woodward, Woodall, I don't recommend you read this book, Seeds of Destruction. I order you to read this book you must read this, this is extremely important, because this, to my knowledge, it's the only book that talks about GMO as a genocide, conscious genocide project. Uh, other excellent books talk about the health risks of GMO and, and various things, but this is the only geopolitical analysis in the world, so far as I know anyway, uh, about the dangers of GMO. And Father Woodall, as secretary of a pontifical academy, uh, I believe it was called the Pontifical Academy of Life, got an audience with the Pope one-on-one -on -one, and briefed him on the real truth about GMO. Well, the next week, a week or so later, came this World Hunger Conference, and the Pope appeared as a speaker, as was planned, and said not a single word about approving GMO. So the U.S. ambassador was blue with rage after this conference, but there was nothing he could do. The Vatican refused to sanction, or the Pope refused to sanction GMO. And he even gave an Easter sermon where he said, these are men playing with genetics. These are men who are playing at being God but aren't. So he had gotten the point quite nicely. You cannot control life in this way. But the Rockefellers are obsessive psychopaths and they don't give up easily. Well, at this point, I mentioned on Friday evening the effect that one woman, one mother in Utah or Idaho had starting a Facebook page called March Against Monsanto. At this point, the GMO lobby has been badly, badly wounded. They're not by any means dead. They still hold the patents. They still have a U.S. Supreme Court that's allowed patents on life to stand in court, something that ought to be prohibited in every country on earth, but it's not. And uh, they are trying to spread GMO in countries where they think they can bribe officials more easily, uh, like China, like Africa, like India, but there are revolts appearing in India, there are revolts appearing in China, and there are revolts appearing all over Africa. So the perspective is by no means bleak, but we should know exactly what it is that's been done to poison us and our children and grandchildren, 
and uh, take the requisite measures to change that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much to, to William Ingdale. It was again a pleasure to, to listen to all this knowledge. I think we should give him one more applause. Thank you. We uh, have time for some questions and I'm sure that there are some. William, um, yeah, yeah. Um, is there, do you know why then uh, Rockefeller, the Ford Foundation, and Linda and Bill Gates fun, uh, Foundation, I don't know, uh, are uh, paying for the Stalwald vault in Norway to keep all the seeds that are not GMO? What is your okay. stake on it? The question was about why the Gates Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation, Syngenta, which is one of the largest GMO corporations, a British Swiss company, uh, why they financed the creation of a nuclear proof seed vault to store all the seed varieties of the entire planet up near the Arctic Circle, inaccessible by Greenpeace boats or almost anything, uh, what, what's going on with that? What, what interest do they have? I, well, the BBC, when they did a story on it years ago, called it the Doomsday Seed Vault. I don't know. I can't answer that, but it sure is a scary thing to me. Are they planning to do something to the seed varieties of the entire planet and then be the ones who control what comes out and in what form it's genetically manipulated or not. I don't know, but it, it certainly is a very scary thing. Uh, one of the first things to happen when the U.S. bombed Saddam Hussein's Iraq back to the Stone Age in 2003, there was, Iraq is the cradle of civilized agriculture, the Tigris-Euphrates Valley, Mesopotamia, and there was a seed bank of wheat varieties in a place in Iraq called Abu Ghraib. We've heard about it all through the prison. Well, during the course of the U.S. bombing of Iraq, that seed bank in Abu Ghraib disappeared. Nobody could say where it went. The farmers had to depend on the U.S. AID to get seeds to plant wheat for the next harvest after the war. And nobody has been able to verify this yet. I, I uh, talked with an Iraqi woman living in the US, but she, she was trying to verify this, that these would be GMO wheat varieties. Perhaps you know uh, if that uh, has been introduced into Iraq by deception. But the seed vault in, in Svalbard is, is uh, it's, it's 1984. It's really scary. I don't know. Yes, I have it. Uh, amazing talk. Thank you for that. Wait, I, I have trouble. Yeah, uh, um, yeah, it was me. Amazing talk. Thank you for that. Uh, the question is, what, uh, what is the excuse they use for the Terminator seats? Who, who would buy them if they have to rebuy them every year? What was the excuse to sell it? to people, so nobody would, would well, in their right mind, buy it. When a, when, a farmer signs, uh, when a farmer signs a license agreement with Monsanto to buy Roundup Ready soy seeds or Roundup Ready corn, mice, 810, whatever, uh, they sign an agreement to buy new seeds from Monsanto every year. The problem is, in many countries like Argentina or Brazil, 
the farmers don't want to buy those seeds every year and they try to re uh, try to plant again from saved seeds but uh, the terminator will make sure that they have to come back every year and rebuy those seeds uh, did you want to comment on that or you had a question okay so the the terminator really locks locks in the uh, uh, the bondage to to Monsanto to the company corporation uh, excellent speak from you but I want to make a comment too I have um, I'm from Sweden and even there is a Swedish contribution to these depopulation plans and in front of me I have a paper military review printed 1970 November. And then in that is an article called Ethnic Weapons. The first time I use that combination. Called what? Uh, the article is called Ethnic Weapons. Ethnic Weapons. And it is. Ethnic, okay, thank you. It was written by a Swede from. Uh, Human Genetic Laboratory in Lund University. Mm -hmm. That's our contribution. I think that should be spread out. So, okay, and then to, I wrote a book about these uh, things too. I, I don't recommend you to read it. I order you to read it. <laughs> and bring it to the Chinese. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I haven't been able to verify this, but there was a report some years ago that the uh, Chemical Warfare Division or something of the Israeli Defense Forces in Israel was trying to perfect an ethnic weapon that would target Arabs, their neighbors. But then they realized that the genetic uh, the genetics of Arab population was so similar to uh, Israeli population that they would end up killing their own people. So they apparently abandoned it. I don't know if that's true or not, but there's all sorts of bizarre things going on. More questions? Um, if the Rockefellers and, and all those, uh, the, the top elite is going to uh, have the GMO uh, crop all over the world, where are they growing their own food? And that's a very good question. Uh, Monsanto Company Cafeteria in England, and I believe someone also told me in, in St. Louis, their headquarters, does not serve GMO food <laughs> to their employees. Same in the White House? Same in the White House? Really? Okay. Uh, yeah, Obama pushes GMO on the American population, but he's not going to eat it himself. That's the wrong kind of change for Obama, I guess. Uh, the, I think people like Prince Charles, it's no accident that he's an ecologist. Uh, he's opposed to GMO, at least, at least for the better people of the planet. And I think they have, they have their restricted areas around the world where they grow GMO free. The, heiress to the Oppenheimer diamond family in South Africa has a huge organic farm and raises chickens and she became alarmed with a, a new shipment of uh, soy feed for the chickens because the chickens suddenly became quite ill. She took it to an independent uh, laboratory in South Africa and the analysis came back that the seed delivery, this new seed delivery, was all GMO seed. The chickens uh, wouldn't eat it, or they got sick when they did eat it. So she became quite alarmed, and that gives you an idea. The Oppenheimer family has sufficient funds from controlling the central selling organization of the world diamond trade that they can afford to grow their own healthy food. I think that's how it works. So if you're going to kill off six billion people around the world, you know, you have your little enclaves protected where you get high-quality food. In the back. 
Yeah, I uh, I have the microphone. <laughs> uh, um, William, I would like to hear if you see any connection between geoengineering and GMO. Between? Geoengineering and uh, GMO. I am not competent to talk about geoengineering, so I, That's I, I could only speculate that there's okay. a connection. Then I'm very f fast. <laughs> Thank you for <clears throat> thank you for your talk. Um, it's a, <clears throat> it's a, a, a bit similar question um, because uh, I've read that uh, Monsanto has a uh, patent on the aluminium, aluminium resistant uh, crops. Um, have you heard about this patent? I, I, acoustically, I couldn't understand you. It's a, a patent that Monsanto has uh, for aluminium resistant Resisting. crop. Okay. Yeah. Have you heard I, about this? They told me this, that they had developed a, a uh, uh, crop that is resistant to aluminum, but, uh, and if it's true what is said about chemtrails containing aluminum particles and uh, barium and so forth, uh, I can only speculate, but I don't have any information. No, okay. No. okay, thank you. Perhaps you, you would know. No, no, I'm sorry. Um, hello. A simple and, and uh, important question: How can you all? How can we all protect ourselves from GMO products? Where is our security? Where can we read about the products in our food stores? Uh, yeah. In the, my book is available on Amazon. I, I don't know if it's Amazon DK, but it's certainly the UK Amazon has it, and. In about two months, it will be available in Swedish language through a, a publishing house that I'm working with in uh, Göteborg. So uh, uh, you can keep an eye out for that and you know start there, I guess. But uh, yeah. Um, I, I didn't quite uh, get it. If is a uh, documentation for that this seed will uh, kill itself after one harvest? Is there doc a written document documentation anywhere? Is I'm sorry. Is there? A um, uh, do you have this in print from some letter uh, that this seed will kill itself after one year? Uh, information about this. Yes, a documentation, I mean. A document. Yeah. Uh, there, it's footnoted in the book, and on my website, williamengdahl.com, you can find articles with footnotes uh, that uh, talk about Terminator. It's in, it's in the patent application to the U.S. government patent office. So it's, yeah. it's, it's no, I think it's no that, secret. No, no, I think also there was something in the Danish media a couple of years ago uh, about it. Mm hmm Yes, I, I can add that uh, I, I've been read the book, Seeds of Destruction is a very informative book and there are links to a lot of footnotes. Uh, so William is not coming up with something he cannot uh, document. Um, that's also why he's sitting here. Um, any more questions? We have this gentleman down here. I come from Stockholm, and we also had a march against Monsanto in Stockholm. It was really nice. I joined it, uh, and it was a lot of talk on Facebook about Monsanto and about oh, we should all boycott Monsanto, and we should boycott Nestle and everyone. The problem is uh, <laughs> that they own so many brands, they own so many products. You have no idea where you find them. Like, it's so hard to boycott them. So I was kind of smiling to myself when I saw this. Reaction. I was like, okay, but how are we going to do that? So my, my question is, what do you do? Like, what's the next action? If you get really involved and you think that, oh, this is wrong, I want to do something, I want to use my power against this, what could you do as a consumer or, or as, a, as a person and as an individual? What do you think? Uh, I think the best answer is, you tell me. Because you, you're much more creative than I am. I, my contribution is to try with, with what 
talents uh, the good Lord gave me to research and get this information out as widely as possible. And people are much more creative. We're, we're too accustomed to uh, waiting for somebody to do it for us, as, as Charles said the other night. We have to take responsibility. It's so simple and so essential for the future of mankind. We have to take responsibility for our own destinies, for that of our family, our children, grandchildren. We have to take responsibility. And that's the only answer I can give you. Good. Thank you very much, William. Uh, I have some small announcement which people uh, gathering this conference have asked me to do. Uh, some of them also very much have my own interests. Um, Maria, please stand up. Have uh, started a donation of money so we can make tests of rainwater here in Denmark. So I hope very much that you can go into the room on the next door to the left and donate uh, some money for us because every, sa every sample we test, if we say, for example, say we would like to test aluminium in rainwater, it costs about 400 crowns. And uh, we already have how much money? We have today 5,400 and we are hoping to, to make different kind of tests of uh, different places in, in Denmark. Uh, I already know they have done that in Sweden. So uh, I hope that you will donate some money for us to help to, yeah, not to spread fear, but to, to get some data so we can have a debate. Is it okay that our rainwater is filled with aluminium and barium? I, I did it myself with uh, snow last winter, and I asked for measurement of three different kinds of stuffs. It was aluminium, barium, and strontium, and all of them were present in the snow. So, the idea is really to maintain the credit with and uh, independently so that it can. Oh, let's keep going. Yeah, hello. <laughs> um, I found out that it will actually be more expensive than the uh, samples that you had analyzed because we have to do it uh, several places and uh, we have to do it uh, accredited and independently so that it can be really used as a documentation. It should not be possible to uh, shoot the evidence down, I mean, yeah, okay. <laughs>